I can listen to the playing of that piano and singing for a little while longer. Would you agree? <laughs> It's just a beautiful thing. Music is a gift from the Lord. Well, I am excited to share a word with you all today. And I hope you all are just as excited to receive. Amen. Isn't it always a pleasure to hear God's word practically applied and shared before the people of God? Perhaps you're someone like me who works in the world and You have the stress of the world on your shoulders. You don't always have an audience of believers or like-minded people. And sometimes you're faced with controversy. I just want to tell you to be grateful that you're here with people that believe like you. Embrace this moment. Can we just embrace the moment that we have right now by being in a room full of people that believe and that love, that are courageous in Christ? Amen. Isn't that a wonderful thing to be celebrated? Can we celebrate Jesus on there? Just clap your hands for Jesus. He never lets us down. He always does his part. And we're thankful for that. I'm excited to share from the book of Acts and the 16th chapter, perhaps a familiar passage of scripture. Thank you so much. Amen. (laughs) for getting those words up for us. So if you don't have your word, we'll talk to you after church. But because we care so much about everyone today, we have it posted for you. So you're able to read along. I've asked that the New King James Version be shared. So I will read from my Bible and you all can follow along there. Or if you have your word, please read along. We're gonna start at the 16th verse. Now it happened. As we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, what's wrong with that? (laughs) Verse 18 reads, and this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that her hope, that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans to receive or observe Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all of the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. I'm gonna pause right there. This is such an intense story. It's so uh, detailed. And I think it's the perfect story to apply to our lives as believers today. If you go to the beginning of the text, Paul and Silas, were simply going through the city. They were in fact on their way to pray. 
That was what they were doing. They were literally on their way to, they weren't on their way to the casino. They weren't on their way to stone someone. They weren't on their way to go have a gossip session. They were on their way to pray. And a demonically possessed girl identified them by their spirit and called them out. And they said, hey, these two guys are the real deal. Isn't that something how a demon-possessed woman was able to tell the truth? Did you notice that? Did you take note that she didn't tell a lie? She actually told what was true. The funny thing about the truth is, it is what it is. No matter who's telling it, right? But sometimes we receive the truth differently depending on the messenger. I can't be by myself. I mean, surely you know someone that you just don't gel very well with. And they come to tell you that you have mail at the mailbox. You probably are going to be somewhat reluctant to even go follow to go to the mailbox just because of that relationship. But if someone you trust and you know you have a relationship with comes and says, hey, you got some mail at the mailbox, all right, I'll get it when I get it or I'll go get it now, you might ask them to go get it for you. The truth of the matter is what? You have mail at the mailbox. That's the truth. But how you act on that, how you receive it, depends on sometimes who's giving you that message. And in this case, you notice the scripture reads that Paul got greatly annoyed. Why would he get annoyed? Because someone's telling the truth on him. It was about where the truth was coming from. It was a demon who had ulterior motives for Paul and Silas. He wasn't telling the truth for the glory of God. He was telling the truth so that they may be condemned to prison. That was the intent. This wasn't to glorify God. She wasn't saying, oh, praise the Lord. They're coming to worship the Lord and they're coming to share the good news. In some ways, she's kind of like, hey, get him. I know none of us have done those things or act that way. <laughs> and if we do, let's just pray, amen? So the young girl annoyed Paul greatly and exposed them. When you start messing with the money uh, you kind of get in some trouble. Did you notice that her job was to fortune tell, to tell the future? She made her magistrate's money. She made her master's money. And when the money stopped flowing, things got a little hazy. And so Paul and Silas were victimized. They were put in prison. All because they were on their way to pray. I mean, just think about that. How many times have you been on your way to pray and all of a sudden you end up in prison? <laughs> right? Anybody in here ever got a free case? Someone accused you or blamed you of something and you weren't even in the vicinity of the situation. Have you ever experienced that? And I mean, have you ever been through something so unbelievable, right? You had done nothing wrong, but here you are a victim. Not only, if you notice, not only were they put in prison, if, if you're reading your word with me, it says they put them in the centermost part of the prison. Not only did they put them in prison and the centermost part of the prison, they shackled and chained them in prison in the centermost part of the prison. Now, now tell me, why would it be so necessary to do so much, to exhaust so much effort to keep Paul and Silas bound. It reminds me of Jesus when he was crucified and they put him in the tomb and they roll this huge stone down to just make sure he stays there. Well, if there's a dead man in a tomb, why are you worried about him coming out? Could it be that you might believe that he really is who he said he is? 
Think about it. They exhausted these efforts to keep Paul and Silas bound because there had to be some kind of fear that the God that they spoke and proclaimed about would come and rescue them. Understand that because you profess Jesus Christ as your personal savior, the world is going to come against you from every way that it can. But we have to be like Paul and Silas. The scripture didn't say that they fought the prison guard. They, it didn't say that they, on the way to prison, begged and pleaded with them, don't do this to me. It just says that Paul and Silas were on their way to pray, and then they uh, got shouted out and called out by a, de de a demon-possessed girl, wound up in prison. But if you read your scripture like we just did, at midnight the word says, they begin to pray and sing hymns. They begin to pray. Now, how many times have you been in prison for, you, for nothing wrong and you decided to pray? <laughs> how many times have you been in a frustrating situation where you had every right to be upset and frustrated expressly, but you decided to use your words for prayer? I mean, really, how often do we do that? Can we do better? Can we do better? Yeah. So I can do better at stopping my emotions for overtaking me. Better yet, praying instead. If you learned anything from Paul and Silas, it was how to control yourself in a situation that you really didn't deserve to be in. But for the sake of the glory of God, I'll go all the way. For your glory, I'll do anything. There are people that are on mission trips right now from their homeland all the way across the world for the glory of God. Will you do me a favor and just ask your neighbor? I want you to literally look at the person sitting next to you and I want you to ask them, say, what are you willing to do for the glory of God? I want you to look at that person you're sitting next to. I want you to ask them, what are you willing to do for the glory of God? of God. I hope their response is anything. Will you do anything to make God proud? Will you do anything to make him smile? If it's suffering a little while, if it's doing something you're not comfortable with, if it's keeping your mouth closed and just keeping that thing to yourself for one more day, are you willing to, am I talking to anybody in here today? Is it putting your emotion, I feel the help of the Holy Ghost, my God today, is it putting your emotions in check and pausing for a while and letting him work on your heart before you open your mouth and let people see how really sometimes silly we can be? It's just for me. Nobody in here is dealing with that. Is, am I by myself? That's okay if, it, if it's Lord pause me for a moment and deal with my heart Lord deal with my mind I'm offended by what was said my name wasn't mentioned but I'm offended the first thing in responsibility of offense is taking uh, taking accountability and understand that you chose to take offense this isn't popular preaching, I know, but you have to decide to be offended. <laughs> you, you, it, it's not automatic. Do you understand that people can say whatever they choose to, but you get a choice to be offended? Oh my God, that's good to me. I can decide if whether or not I want to accept that, and I can decide if whether or not I want to reject that. Just because you said it, I don't have to own it. That's the beauty in Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. He gave you a choice. So in your moment of frustration, what are you going to do? Are you going to pray? Are you going to pray? Are you going to P-R-A-Y? Or are you going to P-R-E-Y? In a moment of frustration, you have a choice. I can pray. 
or I can pray. Many times in church we've prayed so much no one wants to even come. Because we just make this the last thing we do. Before we respond, before we react, let us pray. I want to finish reading the text here because it gets really interesting. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awakening from sleep seeing the prison doors open supposed the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to do what the word says he was about to do for the sake of small ears. Here we are in prison because we were going to pray, because we were doing the Lord's work. I'm in prison. I'm not only in prison, but I'm in the center of the prison, shackled and chained. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how God will rescue us when we allow his will to go forth? Do you understand that the discomfort and the, and the uneasy pain that you may be dealing with today is actually sometimes a part of his will? Are you willing to suffer just a little while for him to get you to the other side of the pain? Oftentimes we mix up the whole purpose and plan that God has for us because we want to expedite the victory. We want to expedite the miracle. We want to expedite the win. But God is looking for people who's going to suffer a little while for him. I mean, really, can we not? He ultimately suffered for us. There's nothing that we could do but say yes to him that compares. Immediately there was a great earthquake and all the prisoners are loose. And the guard is like, well, it's my responsibility to keep these people shackled. So you know what? I'm getting out of here because I'm not going to suffer for this. Watch what happens. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do no harm to yourself. We are all here. If you can give me about 10 more minutes, I don't want to keep you real long, but this is really interesting to me. Paul, who is shackled. Paul, who is in the center of the prison. Paul, who's in prison for wanting to go pray. Paul, who is doing the work of the Lord. Paul is not sitting on a throne. He's not, he's not a king. He's in prison. And he reaches out to the man who's ready to stop everything. And says, we haven't gone anywhere. We're still here. Prisoners are shackled free. And they remain in their cell. Tell me about the work of the Lord. Only God can do a thing like that. This is what happens when you pray. See, prayer changes things, but when you do this, that prison might have been empty. If, if you continue to do that kind of praying, no one's going to stick around, but he prayed and something happened. Prayer changes things. He said, we're all here. We haven't gone anywhere. Shackles are broken. Doors are open. There's an earthquake. They can leave this place right now, but they've not gone anywhere. Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do? To be saved. God is always up to something. And the end result is to give him the glory. Have we passed the test? Or have we missed the mark? Did we allow our emotions to get too powerful and we walked away prematurely? Paul could have run. But if he did, you would have had a man who was killed and not saved. Guys, think about that. What suffering can you commit to the Lord for the sake of someone else's salvation? 
What is it that I can do better, more, that would lead someone to say, what must I do to be saved? Look back at the text. Look at this building. They're in prison. Prisoners are shackled. This prison guard is responsible for keeping these people shackled. Earthquake comes, the building's busted. Prisoners are loose, but they stay where they are. What more evidence in a God do you need? Talk about decency. Talk about order. Talk about respect. If anybody had a right to run out of that prison, it was Paul and Silas. Because they were doing the Lord's work. They weren't prisoners, but they stayed. Can you stay? Whew. My, my, my. Can you stay in the face of adversity? Can you stay in dysfunction? Can you stay for Jesus? If you're willing to stay, look for the end result. What must I do to be saved? Let that be our focus. I want to encourage you to know that prayer changes things. So does prayer. <laughs> God bless you.